Good morning. Um, today we're beginning a short series uh, leading up to Easter, and we're going to be looking at Jesus' cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem after his uh, triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. The reading is from uh, Matthew 21, 12 to 17. I'd ask you, as usual, just to turn to your Bibles or your devices, and uh, Lisa will read to us in a moment. I'll just, I'll just sort of pause so you can turn to the uh, passage. And I'd also like to put in a kind of a bit of a disclaimer that I really find this a strange way um, to be teaching. Um, this isn't live, and so I'm sitting in front of my uh, computer uh talking to a congregation that i'm trying to imagine uh being there in the future and um i'm noticing that i kind of keep looking to one side because actually i've got notes uh that i'm reading so i do apologize um for all of this and i hope it doesn't detract from just an incredibly powerful uh beautiful passage that just reveals so clearly who Jesus is. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the... We're going to be looking at three things. Uh, from this passage. I want to spell this out so we actually know where this preach is going. And the first thing is where does this well-known story fit into Jesus's story? The cleansing of the temple, it's a fairly well-known passage, but when did it occur? Secondly, We'll see that this event and the events around it are fulfilling Old Testament scriptures again and again. And this will leave us with no doubt that these events were from God and central to his plan to fix a creation damaged by sin. And the third thing is that we'll be sitting on the edge of our seats by the end. So make sure you're sitting securely. And uh, we'll round everything up with a look at how this story can become a part of our story, even in these difficult locked in times that we are living through. So the fact that we have jumped from the rebellious kings of Israel last week and week before to the New Testament should be a clue. The jump is because we are in what is the season of Lent for many traditions. That is the weeks leading up to Easter. On Easter Sunday, we will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And the three weeks leading up to Easter, we will be looking at the last week before Jesus' death and resurrection. This is often called the passion of Jesus, where passion in English, like the Greek bathos, have drifted from their original meaning of pain and suffering into something a little bit different. But yes, the well-known story 
Jesus' cleansing of the temple is part of the last week or the holy week culminating in the crucifixion of Jesus. The cleansing of the temple is followed the next day by Jesus cursing a fig tree. At the time of the Passover, which we know living in Cyprus this kind of time of year, is not the time of year that figs are actually produced. It's a summer fruit. But moving on to scripture fulfillment. Religion had turned into quite a business. Sounds familiar. Jesus drives out the merchants and money changers from the temple. And Jesus' actions are a direct fulfillment of scripture. Let me just read from uh, Zechariah 14, 21. And every cooking pot in Jerusalem, the ordinary things, and in Judah will be holy to Yahweh of hosts. And all those who sacrifice will come and will take from them and will cook in them. And there will no longer be a trader in the house of Yahweh of hosts on that day. Again, that's from Zechariah 14, 21. A beautiful description of the day when there won't be a distinction between holy and common. God won't just open the temple, but through all Jerusalem and Judah. So still looking at verses 12 and 13, just for a few moments longer, uh, a little bit of background that will make a bit more sense of what's going on here is that when pilgrims, Jews from diaspora and even Gentiles came to the temple, they were carrying Roman coins that bore the image of Caesar. And the ruling was that these could not be used in the temple because the Roman coins bore the image um, of an emperor. And so they had to be exchanged. And as you can guess, for a rip off exchange rate before they could be used in the temple. And the law also required that any animal brought to the temple to be offered as a sacrifice had to be unblemished. OK, this is something symbolic. It points to Jesus. But um, there was provision. It's in Leviticus 5 verses 7 to 10 that if you were poor, instead of bringing a lamb, you could bring a dove. But what happened? Whatever animal you brought, how did you know what an unblemished animal was? Well, there was official approved by the temple animals that you could purchase. So even a poor person had to buy a very expensive dove, dove uh, at a rip-off rate with rip-off exchange rate money in the temple. And for this reason, Jesus says in verse 13, the temple has become a cave of robbers. And he's getting this from Isaiah 56, verse 7. Isaiah said, I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them merry in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And Matthew omits, but Mark includes that for all peoples or for the nations. So we're getting back to what had been promised to Abraham almost at the very beginning in response to the chaos that sin had caused in Genesis 3 to 11. But still, 
on uh, these verses. Let's have a look at Jeremiah 7. Jeremiah 7 verse 11. So in Jeremiah 7 verse 11, it's in front of us here on the slide, has this house which is called by my name become a cave of robbers in your eyes? Look, even I have seen it, declares Yahweh. Jeremiah 7 11. And just to try to imagine how Matthew's original hearers would have responded to this. The Talmud, which is the sayings of the rabbis of Jesus' day, identified the temple as a house of prayer. Okay, that's not a difficult connection to make. But they linked the temple as a house of prayer with the coming of the Messiah from the line of David. So by using this term, house of prayer, Matthew's original hearers are hearing this is our Messiah. And that term, in my translation here, cave of robbers, it suggests a hideout of bandits. You know, bandits are the outlaws. In some cultures, they're the uh, heroes. And the temple itself has become a place where rebellious people, not those who oppose foreign occupation, etc., but those who oppose Yahweh can hand out, can hide out, excuse me. And rabbinic sources also report that Caiaphas, who was the high priest, had recently shifted the uh, selling of sacrificial animals from the Kidron Valley to the outer court of the temple. Obviously a business opportunity there for the high priest. But the outer temple was the area of the temple for the Gentiles. God fearing Gentiles could always come to the temple and worship and pray to Yahweh, the God of Israel in the outer court. But the Jewish leaders have turned this area into a marketplace to exploit and to cheat the poor. So do you see what Jesus is doing? He's cleaning the part of the temple where the Gentiles were supposed to come and worship. So Matthew is saying Yahweh is blessing the nations as promised to our father Abraham. But moving on, what's happening here was attested to by miracles. The blind and the lame specifically are healed. And they're healed in the temple and they're healed by Jesus. Now, this is a temple. The blind, the lame, a man of any physical defect could not be a priest. That's from Leviticus 21. Yet, here they are being healed in the temple. Foreigners, were excluded by the marketplace, but the outer court is being cleaned. The blind and the lame were excluded. This is actually ceremonial. It's a picture, but you see what is happening. All are being made clean. So it seems that the chief priests and the scribes didn't or perhaps chose not to understand what was happening. But now is the showdown. 
because even the children are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. The children, you see, have understood the one, the long promised son of David is here among them. And the leader's response, they're indignant. They understand what the children are doing. You see, Hosanna means save, we pray. It's a prayer to God. And it was used in the Jewish liturgy at the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a prayer to Yahweh. The children are addressing Jesus as if he is Yahweh. Yahweh having returned to his temple. And the crowds had done the same thing as Jesus had earlier entered Jerusalem. The long awaited son of David, the Messiah, Jesus himself, meet in one person, Jesus. Lest there should be any doubt, Jesus quotes from uh, Psalm 8 2, the first part, which says, From the mouth of children and infants you have founded strength in the Hebrew, but praise in the, uh, the Greek Septuagint on account of your enemies the silence, the enemy, and the avenger. You might think that Jesus is quoting the uh, Septuagint, the Greek translation, probably not. He's using something called a Midrash, just like the other rabbis of his day. He's using the Psalm, but interpreting it using Exodus 15. Because in Exodus 15, the beginning of the chapter, we read, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to Yahweh. Let me sing to Yahweh, because he's highly exalted. The horse and the rider he hurled into the sea. Yah, that's short for Yahweh, is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my Father, and I will exalt him. So the rabbis, including Jesus, could read Exodus 15 and see that because God was their strength and song, that when we read strength, we're actually reading of the of a of songs to God or praise to God. Now Jesus does this little bit uh, of um, ancient Jewish hermeneutics um, without even qualifying it, because this is how the scriptures were read, and. Uh, his hearers would have expected the scriptures to have been read in that way. And the, uh, the Greek translation, which is done before uh, Jesus became flesh and uh, lived amongst us, goes for the praise because it's following that way of interpreting. And so Matthew, knowing his Greek Bible as well, just quotes from the Greek verbatim. So why should we be on the edge of our seats? Well, verse 17 says, Jesus then leaves Jerusalem for nearby Bethany, home of Lazarus. And, you know, Bethany actually literally means house of affliction. Now, is that a cliffhanger or what? Jesus entered 
Jerusalem. He was greeted as a king. He was praised as God himself. And as a divine king, he was led to the temple. Now that was standard practice in the ancient Near East. A royal dignitary, an important person, will be welcomed at the city gates and led to the temple of that city. In Jesus's case, though, it wasn't the leaders of the uh, the Jews that did that. But uh, if you actually go back, it was actually the people from Jericho, common people who had followed him to Jerusalem that led him in. He gets to the temple. The story explodes. Here is this rabbi cleaning out the temple, clearing the outer court for the Gentiles to come in. They bring people who ceremonially are unclean, who could not be priests, who could not enter into the inner temple. He heals them. The rulers are furious. Even little children understand what is happening. Something huge, something gigantic is about to happen. Jesus leaves. He walks to Bethany, the home of his friend Lazarus. But go ahead. Jump on to the next episode. Carry on reading in your Bible. Because the next bit of the story, the next day, as I mentioned before, is Jesus cursing the fig tree. A very strange story. Do you wear contact? lenses? If your answer is no, well the Bible says that you do. And if your answer is yes, then the Bible says that you are wearing two pairs of contact lenses, not one. You see, we all see through lenses. Our lenses are how we interpret the world and our inner self. Different lenses mean that different people can draw very different answers to the same questions. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What does it mean to be fulfilled? The way that you're seeing and understanding the world, you're going to see things differently. Now, the Bible is primarily a story. It's a narrative. It's a collection of stories written for us, given to us by God. It gives us stories that shape our way of seeing the world and our place in it. And at Larnaca Community Church, we're on our third sweep in this kind of mega series, our third sweep through the Bible. And we've laboured. We haven't skipped out the harder parts. And uh, until this season came, uh, you know, we were we'd just been starting to work through the kings of Israel, the northern kingdom. And we need these stories. Jesus needed these stories to understand as a man and to explain to his hearers who he was. Jesus himself even talked in parables. In other words, fictional short stories. So what does this have to do with you and me? Well, may I make a few suggestions? In the beginning of the Bible, 
we have two creation stories. We learn from these stories that everything has purpose and meaning given to it by God. If you don't know, and I mean really don't know the story, you'll be living in a world that has no sense, no purpose. Secondly, we read of humans as God's image bearers, reflecting God, his will and his purposes to the rest of creation. Sadly, we also have a story of sin entering the world, or at least the human realm. Horrible. Sin spreading like a virus to all humans. We read of the effects of sin in one part of the world, the ancient Near East, but we extrapolate and see the same horrible behaviour manifesting in our world. The cause is the same, sin. We read of Abraham and God's promise to bless all the nations through his seed. We read and read. It's like a TV show with season after season. It never seems to end. Some of it reads well. Some of it is, frankly, awful. People who should know better behave very badly. Where's this seed of Abraham that was promised so early on? Etc etc as we read through the scriptures you get the point i'll stop there and just fast forward to today's story how does today's story help you see the world has the seed of abraham come yes even better than we might have imagined but the little children got it. The seed of Abraham is Yahweh himself. Jesus is God himself. Yahweh became Adam or human. Those sinful kings couldn't save the world. Sin. The law couldn't save sin. The law just made people realise they were sinners and sin all the more. Sin. The temple couldn't work as a place where Yahweh could dwell and the nations would come to him. Sin. Yahweh will have to bring the nations to himself. If you binge read ahead, and of course, most of us know the story, today's cleansing of the temple will not work. Sin. No, the temple will be destroyed, Jesus says in Matthew 24. The world will have to end and the new creation begin. How? In just a few days on from where we stopped, Jesus will die at the hands of sinful men. Sin. But sin will have no hold over him. Jesus will be raised from the dead. Sin? No. There's no sin. 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 Is this how you? Are understanding the world?